Good morning, Cornerstone. How are we? Happy New Year. Being Scottish, this is a big deal. We celebrate New Year's. It's a big deal for us. So I am very grateful to be here this morning. As Pastor Eric said, uh, for me and my wife Sarah and our kids, this is our spiritual home. Uh, we're 10 a.m. people, so we don't recognize many of you. We normally come to the 10 o'clock service. But uh, God had called us, as Pastor Eric shared, almost a decade ago to move to Connecticut to pioneer Chi Alpha at Yale. Now, what is Chi Alpha? Well, the movement we're all part of, the Assemblies of God, the outreach to the secular universities of America is called Chi Alpha. And so we are on over 300 campuses in the US, mobilizing about 20,000 students. And about 10 years ago, God called us to pioneer one at Yale. And we have been there since that point, uh, just fulfilling the words of God and the call of God on our life. But we also want to say this moment a big thank you. You know, you and your sacrifice and prayer and giving financially allow us to be the hands and feet of Jesus at Yale. So we're incredibly grateful to you that you allow us to do what God has called us to do on that campus. But this morning, I have the privilege of bringing the word. And I want to start by telling you the story about a, a famed violinist. And she was asked, how did she become so good at the violin? And she thought about it for a moment and she said two words, planned neglect. And the woman who was interviewing her looked at her and was like, well, what does that mean? And she said, here's what it means. It used to be that I would get up in the morning, I would go downstairs, I would have breakfast, I would come up to my room, I would tidy my room, I would put things away, I would dust my room, I would make my bed, I would dust some more, I would tidy some more, I would move some things around, and then I would start to practice my violin. And then I had the revelation or the realization that this was wrong, this was not right. So I had some planned neglect. I neglected doing those things so that I could make the main thing the main thing, which was to practice my violin. You see, for her, she had a goal, and the goal was to be great at the violin, but what she realized was, her revelation was, that wasn't really her goal. <laughs> because her behaviors and her actions showed her that the goal was really procrastinate. It was just do anything but play violin. And when she realized that, she changed she realized her motivation was wrong, so she changed her behaviors because of that. Can I say it's often the same for those of us as we follow Jesus? When someone may ask you the goal, what's the goal of being a Christian? Your answer may be to become more like Jesus, to follow Jesus. But can I say that often that's not really our goal? Can I suggest that a lot of the time our goal actually is I want to do things that means that God might love me. I'm going to do certain things that he might be pleased with who I am. That I might somehow earn his love. Now, how can I say that? Well, here's a little litmus test for you. You start the day, you go out, and you just didn't pray or read your Bible or spend time with Jesus, and you're like, it's going to be a bad day. Day's not going to go very well. And you have a sense of guilt or a sense that, you know, what am I doing? And is God displeased with me? Is he angry with me? Is he silent? And then other days you get up and you spend time with Jesus. And you go into your day and you're like, it's going to be a good day. I spent time with God. God loves me. Can I say both of those are wrong? Respectfully. Because what that tells me is we're trying to earn God's love. We're trying to work ourselves to the point that we deserve the goodness of Jesus. Well, I did this, therefore I deserve or I did this, therefore he'll be happy with me. He'll be pleased with me because of my actions and behaviors. In both of those cases, it's a sign that our goal is not really our goal. We might say our goal is to love and follow Jesus, but really our goal becomes, I've got to do the right things that he will be pleased with me. And often that's how we live as we follow Jesus. Can I say something this morning? God loves you. You can't earn something that you've been given freely. You can't work for something that he gives. He loved you when you had no thought of him. He loved you when you had no care for him. So how can it be any different now? You can't earn something that was given freely. And can I say we don't deserve it? We don't. 
But in the goodness of our God, he gives us his love. He saves us. He redeems us. He makes us new creations. Him. And then we live from that place in life. But so often we have our goals the wrong way around. Well, if I do this, he'll love me. If I do this, he'll be pleased with me. I didn't do this, oh, I feel guilty. All signs that we don't understand how and who God is. So this morning, at the start of a new year, when everyone's making goals and resolutions, can I encourage you this morning? Maybe the goal needs to be I need to stop and think about my motives. Am I trying to earn God's love? Am I trying to work that he will be pleased with me? Or am I living from a place where I know he loves me and out of that I live? Out of that I act? Out of that I behave? That's a very different way of living. So let's look at a story this morning, a beautiful Jesus story that speaks to that. It's found in Luke 10. Luke 10, verses 38 through 42. We're going to read it together. Let's look at it. Luke 10, verses 38 through 42. It says the following. Now, as they went on their way, he entered a certain village. I'll read it up there. Came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you're worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it and it will not be taken away from her. Here we have these two. Let's set the scene. The rabbi is coming for a meal. That's a big deal in their culture. In Middle Eastern culture, hospitality is everything. And it's the fact it's not even anyone, it's the rabbi that's coming. This was going to be a big meal. And culturally, Martha's doing the right thing. She's preparing the meal. And culturally, her sister should be doing the same. And so Jesus walks in, and they're in this meal setting, and Martha's like, hey, Jesus, can you tell her to help me? She should be doing this. And what does Jesus do? Martha, you're wrong. Mary, I commend you. Wait, what? Time out, Jesus. That's not right. That's not, no, she should be helping her sister. Culturally, this is what she should be doing. Jesus, why are you rebuking the right and approving of the wrong? No, Jesus, no, no, what are you doing? But as ever, Jesus is speaking to us 2,000 years later about how we live, how we live today. 2,000 years on, we are still Martha's and Mary's. And we need to look at this story this morning as we start a new year and ask ourselves some hard questions if we're going to live a life that honors God in the coming year. So let's start with Martha. Now, I don't know about you, I'm a Martha. That's just my personality. I am Mr. Practical, to-do list, let's get it done. What's the job? Yes, let's go. So I am in Martha's corner. This is me. So here's Martha. She's doing the right thing. The rabbi is coming, the meal must be prepared, and it is on her shoulders to do so. And it's going to be elaborate, it's going to be big. She's out to impress Jesus. That might be a sign that that's a problem. And so, she's preparing the meal. Now, it's really interesting. Jesus speaks to her. She's like, hey, come on, speak to, speak to Mary, Jesus. But Jesus looks at Martha, and it's almost as like, hey, Martha, here, look at me, I'm here. Two eyes on me. You see, the first thing Jesus does is he speaks to her. Now, it's not a rebuke and it's not a scolding like it's like, it's not like, hey, Martha, what you doing? That's not what Jesus is doing in this moment. It's much more gentle. It's like, hey, Martha, Martha, do you see me? Hey, hey, I'm here. I'm right here. 
Can you see me? So the first thing we have is Jesus drawing Martha's attention to him. Not the things, not the distractions to me. Can you see me? But it's interesting. When you break down the language here, the word that's used for distraction is a really interesting word. It basically is an image of like getting pulled in a hundred different directions. That's what Martha is doing. She doesn't, she can't settle. She's like, I need to do this. I need to do this. Here's the rice. Here's the chicken. Here's the olives. Here's the vegetables. She's getting pulled in a hundred different ways because she wants to impress Jesus. She wants, well, will this please him? Will this please him? Will this be good enough? Will that? Can I earn his love? Can I earn his approval? Can I earn his acceptance by all of my doing? And so this word, it's what she's doing. And she, she can't see anything but all these different things. And what does it give her? Anxiety, stress, worry. But it's more than that for you and me today. So often in our Christian life, respectfully, I think that's how we live. Well, I, if I pray, will he love me? If I serve through the church, will he approve of me? We might not realize it consciously, but unconsciously, our behaviors and actions, often that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get Jesus to love us. But our distractions go beyond that in our world. We live in a distracted world, don't we? This thing. Now, for those of us who have that next to our bed as our alarm clock, go buy a 10 buck alarm clock from Amazon. There's my first challenge for you today. I need my phone. It's my alarm clock. Go buy another one. Because this is what happens. Beep, beep, beep. Oh, flick, 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 flick. And the day starts. And already we're going through this thing. How many of us feel happy after we go through our phone? Not many. What do we often feel? Anxiety. Stress. That tweet, that image, those words. What a great way to start our day. Put it down. Walk away. Our lives are distracted. And the thing is, many of our distractions, they're good things that need to be done. I have two kids. I need to get them out for school. That's not a choice. They might wish it was a choice. But it's like, no, no, dude, your bus comes at 6.40. You're good to go. 6.40? Then my daughter, an hour later, she's off. And then me and my wife, we have to, as missionaries, we have to work. We have to do. So many of the things we do are good things. But the problem is we just fill ourselves with good things. Things that need to be done. And we're spinning all these plates. And suddenly our day is full of distraction. And Jesus is like, hey, Martha, I'm here. Can you see me? I'm right here. I don't have time. And so we end up the distractions of trying to please him by things we do. And then the distractions of just life crowd him out. Listen to this quote by C.S. Lewis. This is one of my favorite quotes. He says this, it comes the very moment you wake up each morning. All your wishes and hopes for the day rush at you like wild animals. And the first job each morning consists simply in shoving them all back. In listening to that other voice, taking that other point of view, letting that other larger, stronger, quieter voice come flowing in. And so on all day. Hey, hey, I'm here. I'm here. Can you see me? Can you hear me? But Martha's too distracted. She's not doing bad things but she's forgotten the main thing. And then we come to Mary. Now, as I said, I'm a Martha, so I'm like, I don't like you, Mary. I don't like you at all. If you were in my house, you'd be like, hey, go. Go help your sister. Because I'm a Martha. I'm a practical person. Hey, the meal needs to be done. Go and help with the meal. But the flip side of me is I'm also the youngest of three. I have two older sisters. And I was a spoiled boy. So I'm like, I ain't doing nothing. It's not my job. It's my sister's job. So I can see both their positions. But here's Mary. Now the expectation was she should be helping her sister. That's the right thing to do. Culturally, she should be in the kitchen. That was their norm. 
but she's sitting at the feet of Jesus. Now here's the deal. It would be not just them that would be in the meal, there would be others there. Hospitality is the big deal, so there's lots of guests. I can promise you the other guests would be like, hey Mary, go. I can promise you. So they'd be giving a little side eye. Go help your sister. And she's like this. She would have been uncomfortable. It would have been awkward. But she chose to remain and listen at the feet of Jesus. And what does Jesus say? Martha, she's found the main thing. Now, can I make a little caveat here, though? I am not saying we do not serve and do. Please hear me loudly when I say that. But I'm saying when the serving and doing come before being with Jesus, it's the wrong way around. Because then we're serving and doing out of our strength. But when I spend time with him first, I then serve and do out of his strength. Because when I serve out of my strength, I complain, I'm critical, I grumble. But when I have spent time with Jesus, I'm not saying it's all gone, but my heart is different. I want to serve for him. Whether that's in kids' church or greeting or production, whatever it is, my heart is changed because it's no longer me that's leading, it's him. So Martha's sitting at Jesus' feet, and Mary's sitting at Jesus' feet, just listening to his words. When we sit at Jesus' feet like Mary, the first thing that happens is we hear Jesus. We hear his words, whether we are in scripture, or in a good devotional, or a good book, we hear him speak. But it goes beyond that. I can then tell him about my distractions. I can tell him about the things that cause me anxiety and stress. Martha was not doing that. Martha was just trying to deal with it all. Whereas when I sit and spend time with Jesus, the first thing I can do is say, Jesus, this has given me stress. This is causing me anxiety. We got ourselves a new dog this year. Oh, why? He's six months old. He's a mini Australian shepherd. And this dog just like has no limits to his energy. So at 5 a.m., I'm like, no, please, no, not 5 a.m. But I walk him every day. It makes no difference in this dog's life. But I walk him every day. And part of my walk is I surrender my day to Jesus. And I simply go, Jesus, these are the things in my day. I'm meeting with this student. I'm teaching on this. And I literally surrender them. I surrender my anxieties. I surrender my stressors. I surrender my distractions. And I listen. Just like Mary does in this moment. You know, there's a really famous cathedral in Milan. It's called the Duomo. And there's three arches that you enter in. And above the first arch is a wreath of roses. And there's an inscription that says, all that gives pleasure is but for a moment. And on the other side, over the other arch, there's a cross and it says, all that which brings trials is but for a moment. And over the central arch it says, and all that which is important is eternal. And what does that mean? We will have pleasures and joys in life. Good things. But here's the kicker. They're for a moment. We will have trials and testings and temptations. But here's the good news. They will be for a moment. They will never leave our lives. We will have moments of joy and moments of trial. I love that last song we sang this morning. The highland, highlands and the heartaches. Yes and amen, Jesus. And the longer you walk, the more that becomes real. That there will be both. But when we go in through the middle gate into that cathedral, all that which is important is eternal, that's Jesus. Spending time with him, being like Mary, means we can handle both the joys and the pleasures and the trials and temptations. They won't magically disappear. Sorry. While we live in this fallen world, we walk through a fallen world. But Jesus can work in us and through us. Amen. 
as we go through these days. So here is like my root question in this story. Why is it recorded in the Gospels? Why does Luke include this? Why is this Jesus story so important? And I think it's simply this. Jesus knows us better than we know ourselves. And if we are left to our own devices, we will try and earn his love. We will try and think that we deserve his love by the things we do. We will try and please him by what we do. And this is a reminder that when we do that, we live like Martha, spinning the wheels, always distracted. And Jesus is like, hey, Rob, I'm here. I'm right here. Can you see me? It's like rubbing the genie on the day. I prayed, I read my Bible, I rubbed the genie, it's going to be a good day. But the days that we rush out the door and we don't rub the genie, oh, it's a bad day. Things will go wrong. That's a lie. That's living like Martha when we're called to live like Mary. You know, this story is very interesting. It's right after the Good Samaritan. Luke puts it here for a reason. Because the Marthas of the world read the Good Samaritan and go, yes, that's it. Just serve. Just do. Which is right. But as I said, if it's just serving and doing, it's my strength and my works. But this story comes straight after to remind us that our serving and our doing, our actions and behaviors flow from knowing that God loves us, that he saved us, that he delivered us, and is delivering us, and is saving us, and is redeeming us. And when we live from that place, then I can do the Good Samaritan. Because it's not me, it's him in me. Amen. There's a really famous painting by an uh, artist called Adolf Menzel. And it's called Frederick the Great. And it's about this great general. And he painted the, okay, and he did all of the side work and all of the other um, people in the painting and the background. Because he was going to paint Frederick in last. But then he died. So the painting was never finished. This is so often our life. We fill a life with the doing. We fill a life with all these things that we think will please Jesus, but Jesus is missing. He should be the center. He should be first. Too busy being like Martha and forgetting we need to first be like Mary. Martha's not excluded, but Mary comes first. And then we live like Martha from that point. So as I close this morning, who are you living like? Who are you living like today? Is it Martha? I know that's my, that's my lean. My lean is Martha. I did all these things today. I feel good. God loves me. I deserve his love today. I deserve a blessing because I did all these things. Then the other days of yeah, that's mm, not a good day. Something's going to go wrong. I feel guilty. God's silent. And both of those are wrong. Let's go back to one of my first statements this morning. You are loved by God. Jesus gave himself for you when you had no thought for him. And if he did that when you had no thought for him, how can it be any different today? You, ha you can't deserve it. You can't earn it. It is the beauty of the love of the triune God. That in his completion and perfection, he said, I invite you in. He does not need us to complete him. He does not need us to somehow fill a void in his life. But in the perfection of the Trinity, the perfect community says, we invite you in. So are you like Martha this morning? Or are you going to be like Mary? To live like Mary can feel awkward and uncomfortable at times because it will run countercultural to how we live. So how can we do it? Let me give you two ways this morning as I close as to how you can live like Mary this morning. Here's the first one. Practice a Sabbath. Whoa, Rob, would you just say? Sabbath, mm-mm, I have no time for a Sabbath. Yes, you do. <laughs> I 
Isn't it interesting, the Ten Commandments, you know, the, the Ten Words, the Decalogue, we will say, yes, do not murder, that's right. And we'll say yes to this and yes to that, but when it comes to the Sabbath one, we're like, eh, really? Is that optional? I feel that's an optional one. Do we think that's optional? And we justify it out of ourselves. Now, I understand this, because I'm a Martha. I want to do but you see, when you Sabbath, what you say is, it's not me, it's you. I don't control everything, you do. I don't need to run everything, you do. This world will get on okay without me in this moment. Now, I know that's hard for me to hear, because I feel like the world needs me. Everybody needs me. But Sabbath says the opposite. It says it's you. And when we hear Sabbath, often we're like, what does that mean? Does that, can you breathe on a Sabbath? I don't, I don't really know. Can, can, I, can, I, can I walk on a Sabbath? What? Here's a Sabbath. Are you ready? Four things you can do in Sabbath. Number one, worship. You're doing that right now. Check. Worship on a Sabbath. Worship God. Number two, have a meal with friends or family. That's Sabbath. Have a slow meal. And I'm not saying, you want to go to Wendy's? We can drive through. No. Do it in a home. <laughs> That's a very Scottish thing. We do that. We invite people in all the time to our homes on a Sunday after church. And just have a meal and laugh and talk. Third thing you can do on a Sabbath, rest. Rest. We think Sabbath is like, I just sleep for 24 hours. No. Worship. Have a meal and rest. And then finally, play. What do you mean play? Well, play can be reading a book. Play can be going on a walk. But play. And when you do those four things, what you're saying is, I'm not in control. You are. I can pause because you're still working. We sang that this morning in Waymaker. When I don't see it, when I don't feel it, you're still working. Let's live like we believe it. Let them work. So the first thing is Sabbath. And here's the other thing I want you to do. And now I know these are challenges. A challenge to my heart as much to yours. Is to daily get on your knees to pray. Now, some of you may say, I could get down. I don't know if I can get back up. So if that's you, good comfortable chair. Recliner is absolutely fine. That's my favorite. And if you're American, good cup of coffee. If you're Scottish, good cup of tea. And just be with Jesus. Because what you're doing in that moment is you are stopping. And you're saying, you know what? I can stop. And I can be. And I can listen as he speaks. And I can tell him about my day. And I can invite him into my day. And all the distractions of trying to prove that my love for him, all the distractions of the day can melt away. And here's my challenge to you. When you have that time of prayer, I'd encourage you to begin your prayer like this. God, I cannot earn your love. I, I don't deserve it. I can't work for it. And I can't please you by what I do. But I can receive the fact that you love me. And I believe the fact that you love me. And you have good plans for me and you're redeeming me and healing me and you're working in me and through me. Audibly pray that prayer. Sabbath and get on your knees. Let me read from the message. Now the message isn't a translation, it's an interpretation, but let's finish by listening to what Eugene Peterson says in the same passage. As they continued their travel, Jesus entered a village. A woman by the name of Martha welcomed him and made him feel quite at home. She had a sister, Mary, who sat before Jesus, hanging on every word he said. But Martha was pulled away by all she had to do in the kitchen. Later she stepped in, interrupting them. Jesus, don't you care that my sister has abandoned the kitchen to me? Tell her to lend me a hand. Then Jesus said, Martha, dear Martha, you're fussing far too much and getting yourself worked up over nothing. One thing only is essential, and Mary has chosen it. It's the main course, and it won't be taken from her. 
planned neglect. A moment of revelation to realize that what I said was my goal is not really my goal. And too often our goal is to try and, how, try and somehow have God love us by what we do and say. When we live from that place of love. And when we realize that, we can live like Mary. And we can also then work like Martha. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for these words. We pray that these words would change our soul. That we would be metamorphosed into more like you, Jesus. Lord, we acknowledge that there's nothing good in us. We don't lean into these words. Our affections don't land on these words naturally. So we need you. God, would you speak to us and through us? Would you change us? Would these words become real words in our soul? That we would see you saying, I'm here. Can you see me? So Lord, we surrender it all to you. While every head is bowed and eyes are closed, Maybe for some of you, you've never given your life to Jesus to begin with. You didn't realize you could stop bearing your anxieties and stresses. If that's you this morning, where our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, would you raise your hand to say, Jesus, I want to give all these things to you for the first time ever. If that's you, would you raise your hand and say, I need you. Yes. Father, we just choose to commit 22 to you. God, let our goal be that we would be like Mary and then we would live like Martha. Lord, thank you for every person here. Lord, we pray that you would bless them and keep them, that you would make your face shine upon them and you would give them your peace. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rob. Appreciate that word. Uh, let me ask you this question. Uh, what are you becoming by the things that you're doing? Right? If, uh, what I've discovered is, you know, when I'm striving and trying to earn God's love, I become either self-righteous because I feel like I've accomplished it, or I get, become more anxious because I, I don't know if I'm living up to it. You know, I'm striving, and well, I've vacillated between uh, both of those things as I try to strive. So thank you so much for reminding us to rest in Jesus, to trust in him, to live out of a life of love and relationship uh, from him. It, it makes all the difference in the world. And what a great encouragement to Sabbath. You know, our whole week could be different if we lived out of a Sabbath, right? Actually, just like we live our relationship with God, we live out our work lives and everything else out of a place of rest. And uh, so it's Rob shared with you this morning, if you've get, given your life to Christ today, right, this is the beginning point for you to living a life of Sabbath, a life of rest, resting what Jesus has done for you, not what you do to save yourself, but what he's already done on your behalf. That changes everything. That really does transform everything as we live that way. So again, what a great encouragement. And if you prayed this morning, if you're taking that step for the first time, uh, we'd love to help you. We'd love to, uh, you know, maybe you're wondering, what do I do now that I've taken that step? I've surrendered to Christ. Whether you're online or here, what do I do? Well, we'd love to help you with that. Uh, simply let us know by uh, using the connection card in your seat. You can just fill that out and say, hey, I'm surrendering my life to Christ today. Place that in the offering boxes on your way out. We'll, we'll get in touch with you. Uh, you can uh, use other means. We have a text number that you can do. If you're online, there's a connection card there as well for you to let us know that you're taking that step. And if you have any questions, we'd love to, you know, help you take the next step and walk with Jesus and live that out. That's just the beginning point, right? Now it's living uh, every day in resting in what Jesus has done. And we're here uh, to help you with that. I want to give you an opportunity to respond to the Lord this morning with your tithes and your offerings, a way that we worship God, right? It's a part of our worship. And so there's a number of ways that you can do that here at Cornerstone. Uh, you can download the PushPay app and use that if that's what you prefer. Just look for Cornerstone Cheshire, and you can give that way. You can give online. Go to our website, cornerstonecheshire.com. Look for the giving link. There's a way for you to give 
there. You can use the envelopes found in the seat in front of you. Just fill that out. Designate where you want your giving to go. Place it in the offering boxes, and we'll, we'll take it uh, from there. And so we appreciate your faithfulness in giving, right? The everyday work of the gospel happens because of your faithfulness. And then finally, we want to give you an opportunity to just respond in prayer. Uh, we do have people who will be available to pray with you and for you at the end of the service. Uh, if you want someone to pray with you about something, perhaps that Rob mentioned, that's just, I need to give this to God, right? We're here to pray with you. You can come. Someone will be here to pray with you. If you wanted to come forward and just kneel at the altar or maybe turn your seat into a place of prayer, please do so. It's an opportunity for you to connect with God and, and just let part of the message and worship and everything kind of percolate its way down into your heart and into your life. So I want to pray, uh, pray for you and with you, pray for our offering before we uh, dismiss you into the, into the rest of this week, the beginning of this week and the rest of the day. So would you pray with me? Father, thank you today. Thank you again for your love and grace. Thank you for this good word. Thank you for this time of worship. And Lord, we want to carry this into the week. We want to we want to take it with us, and so help us by the Holy Spirit, Lord, to do that, to walk out what we do. For those who are taking their first step of faith and surrendering, Lord, let them experience that new life you talk about, forgiveness and a new beginning, a fresh start, Lord. We pray that you'll touch them and that today will we'll just be different. They'll see everything differently because of what you've done in their heart and in their life. And, Lord, we pray now as we go into our work week, we want to walk into our workaday worlds, resting in you, trusting in you, knowing that you love us, knowing that you have provided for all that we need. And Lord, help us to do that, we pray. And Lord, we pray finally for our offering. And we ask that you receive it as our worship, use it to advance your kingdom around the world, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much again for being with us. It's a privilege to have you worship with us. Uh, we hope you have a blessed week, and we look forward to seeing you again next Sunday. Have a great week.